Hello, my name's Brian Atkinson and welcome once again to UK Aircraft Explored. In today's video, we shall be covering the Arrow Lancaster's undercarriage, which I'll be referring to the wartime air ministry manuals that were used by air and ground crews at the time. I hope you find this interesting. The Lancaster is fitted with two retractable single wheel units with twin doughty oleo pneumatic shock absorber struts. The undercarriage track is 23 foot 9 inches. Each main wheel unit consists principally of two identical shock absorber struts held rigidly together by bracing tubes and carrying a wheel between them. At the top of each strut is fitted an eye end which forms the attachment to the engine subframe, whilst at the lower end is mounted the wheel axle. The construction of the lower end allows easy removal of the wheel and axle. Brake torque load is transmitted to the shock absorbers through links connected between the lower end fitting of each strut and the brake drum. At the lower end of each shock absorber strut is an attachment for the joined retracting strut, the other end of which hinges in a bracket mounted on the bottom boom of the rear spar of the main plane. At the joint in the retracting strut is the locking mechanism, which secures the unit in its up or down position. The piston rod of the retracting jack is also attached to this joint and the cylinder of the jack is hinged about a hollow shaft mounted in bearings on the top boom of the rear spar of the aeroplane and through which hydraulic fluid is supplied to the jacks. Each pair of jacks is connected by bracing struts at the lower ends of the piston rods and a conduit stay at the tops of the cylinders. This conduit also supports an emergency air non-return valve through which fluid, or air in case of emergency, is passed to the jacks. The fitting of a balance pipe between the two shock absorber struts ensures that the air pressure is the same in both of them and that their action is synchronised. When the undercarriage jacks are brought into operation to raise the wheel units, the initial inward movement of the piston rods releases the down latches and further compression results in the braking of the retracting strut and the complete retraction of the unit. At the end of which, the up latch engages a pin on the ribs at the top of the compartment to lock the unit in the retracted position. When the up or down latches are operated, an electrical circuit is closed and causes an indicator in the cockpit to show the pilot the position of the unit. The oleo pneumatic shock absorber struts consist of an upper tube attached to the aeroplane by a socket. The shock absorbing action is affected by an assembly in the upper tube, consisting of an upper cylinder containing compressed air and a lower cylinder containing oil. When the strut is operated, the cylinder slides up and oil is forced through the damping valve and enters the other cylinder, where it further compresses the air. At the same time, the piston is driven up inside the air cylinder by the piston rod. There are two retracting struts to each main wheel unit. Each one is in two sections, knuckle joined together, the lower end being attached to the shock absorber unit and the upper end hinged to a bracket attached to the rear spar of the centre section. At the knuckle joint and attached to the upper section of the retracting strut are the up and down latches which lock the unit in position. The position of the unit is indicated electrically in the cockpit. When retracting the unit, the final movement of the up latch operates a micro switch, indicating that the unit is locked in the up position. Similarly, the final movement of the down latches depresses a plunger on the micro switch, 
showing that the unit is locked down. The tail wall unit is a fixed oleopneumatic self-centering type secured to the rear fuselage by means of plug and sleeve. The undercarriage indicator, the Doughty 6153, is mounted on the pilot's instrument panel and gives the following indications for the various positions of the undercarriage. Undercarriage locked up gives no lights. Undercarriage unlocked, red lights. And undercarriage locked down, green lights. A master switch is mounted adjacent to the ignition switches and fitted with a bar which prevents the ignition being switched on until the undercarriage indicator has been switched on. Conversely, the latter cannot be switched off before the ignition. The indicator is operated by the undercarriage up and down switches. The two up switches on the up catches in each nacelle, which are used as on off switches, are connected in parallel and remain in the on position until the undercarriage is locked up. Red lights will therefore show until both latches on each undercarriage unit have been locked. The two down switches, which are fitted in the locking mechanism, are used as two way switches and are connected in series, ensuring that the green lights for each undercarriage unit cannot indicate until both switches have been operated. An undercarriage warning horn is mounted below the port cockpit rail. It's connected in series with a throttle switch in the engine control pedestal and the red lamp side of the down switches. The throttle switch closes if the throttle is less than one third open and if the undercarriage is in any position except locked down, the circuit will be completed through the down switches and the warning horn will sound. Sound is emitted by a vibrating plunger striking a steel diaphragm. A test lamp and test push switch for the horn is mounted on the port cockpit rail. Moving on, the hydraulic system operates the main wheel units, bomb doors, main plane flaps, air intake shutters and the fuel jettisoning system. The system is operated by two engine driven pumps one mounted on each inboard engine and controlled by levers or handles in the cockpit. A hand pump is included in the system and mounted on the port side of the fuselage between the armoured bulkhead and the front spar, but is only used to operate the air intake jacks or the jettison system in emergency. It is possible to lower the bomb doors by means of the hand pump, but it takes approximately 15 minutes of pumping. Due to the capacities of the jacks, it is not normally possible to operate the main wheel units or flaps by hand pump. While none of the units are in operation, the engine pumps are idling and the fluid is circulating at low pressure from the pumps through a filter and an automatic cutout valve to the reservoir. Here's a circuit diagram of the whole hydraulic system. The raising and lowering of the main wheels are governed by the hand operation of a selector valve on the right of the pilot's seat. This is always in either the up or down position. There is no neutral. When the selector lever is moved to the up position, fluid is delivered through the non-return valve and selector valve to the underside of the jack pistons 
and raises the main wheel units. When the selector lever is moved to the down position, the above sequence of operations is repeated, except that this time the fluid is fed to the top side of the jack pistons via an emergency air transfer valve carried on a stay between each pair of jacks. We'll now take a look at the flaps and main wheels emergency system. In the event of the failure of the engine driven pumps or the main wheel circuit, the main wheels and flaps can be lowered by means of compressed air. In early aircraft, the air is stored in a cylinder and in later aircraft, in two oxygen type bottles mounted behind the front spar. The system is operated by turning on a cock on the starboard side of the fuselage. When the system is operated, the main wheels are lowered at once, but the flap control handle has to be operated in the normal manner. The air is admitted to the downside of the main wheel jacks through a non-return valve near the cylinder and through an emergency air valve and a transfer valve to each pair of jacks. The non-return valve serves as a lock for the air once the main wheels have been lowered. The emergency air valves pass the air to the transfer valves and allow the fluid on the underside of the jack pistons to discharge to the atmosphere. The transfer valves blank off the normal fluid supply line and admit air to the jacks. The air is supplied to the flap control unit by a separate pipeline, but from there to the jacks, the air passes through the hydraulic pipelines. Moving on, the pneumatic system operates the Dunlop type wheel brakes, the thermostatically controlled electro pneumatic rams of the radiator flaps, and the electro pneumatic rams for the supercharger controls. And in Lancaster Mark III aircraft only, the slow running cutout controls also. Compressed air is supplied from a container which is kept charged to 300 pounds per square inch by a Haywood compressor mounted on the starboard inboard engine. The pressure maintaining valve set to 100 to 110 pounds per square inch is fitted in the supply line to all the surfaces except the brakes to ensure that sufficient pressure is always reserved for brake operation by cutting off the other surfaces if the pressure falls to the set figure. The working pressure of the wheel brakes is 80 pounds per square inch so that in the event of compression failing it is possible to obtain several applications of the brakes from the container. A pipeline from the compressor runs to the pressure regulating valve on the rear face of the fireproof bulkhead through an oil and water trap on the auxiliary's panel between the undercarriage support beams. The pipe is then continued inboard along the front spar and forward on the starboard side of the fuselage to the air container mounted just after the front turret. From the container, the air is delivered through a filter on the port side of the various services. The installation of the system is shown here. The brakes are applied by operating the lever on the pilot's control yoke and differential action is obtained by means of a Dunlop relay valve mounted on fusage former F and connected to the port rudder pedal arm by a rod. Air is delivered through the filter to the differential relay valve. Two pipes run aft from the relay valve to the front spar and outboard to the port and starboard wheel brake units. A triple pressure gauge on the pilot's instrument panel connected to each of these lines and to the delivery to the relay valve indicates the pressure in the container and in each of the brake supply lines. Finally, here are some views of the Lancaster's brake assembly.
along with views of the jury strut and stowage. Well that's it for this video, I hope you found it interesting. If you like what I do on this channel, please click the like button and consider subscribing, and also click the bell. Remember it's free, and you'll receive notifications when my future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.